We're looking for a couple of weeks at some personal petitions. I call them Nancy's personal petitions, but I hope they'll be yours by the end of this series. Things that I have prayed frequently, repeatedly over the years that I long to be true in my life. And I don't sit down as a rule and pray through all 10 of these, so I think that's a great idea. And in order to help you think that way, we're offering a resource that is a little booklet that has all 10 of these in it uh, with some making it personal questions, some quotes, some scripture references, some places to journal so you can meditate on these petitions. And then also including five cards. Each of those cards has all 10 of these prayer requests listed on it. You can put them in different places where you will find them, one in your car, one in your bathroom, one next to your night, on your nightstand perhaps. Uh, so that throughout 2016, as we're seeking to become women of prayer, we wanna be praying biblically for ourselves and then we'll be also talking about how to learn to pray for others. So the 10, let me just read them off. We have already looked at numbers one and two, guard my heart. And then number two, fill me with your love. Today we're gonna look at number three, fill me with your spirit. And then the others we'll be looking at over these next days, clothe me in humility, make me a servant, guard my tongue, give me wisdom and discernment, give me a grateful spirit, teach me the fear of the Lord, and help me to walk by faith and not by sight. Now, I'm probably not going to say much, if anything, about any of these requests that's new to you. Not if you've been around the faith any length of time. This is not rocket science. This is just a matter of meditating on these requests, on these petitions, and saying, let's flesh those out a little bit. What would it look like to be filled with the love of God? Today, what would it look like to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God? And to get us to the place where we so long for that, that we're asking God for the things that we really need and the things that he really wants to give us. If we ask anything according to his will, 1 John says, we know that we have the petition that we've asked of him. So we can ask in faith. I can by faith pray, Lord, fill me with your spirit because I know it's God's will for me to be filled with his spirit. So you notice you didn't see on this list of regular petitions anything that is give me this money or give me that relationship or give me that. Now, it's not wrong to pray for those things as their needs and as God prompts, but these are 10 timeless ways to pray, not only for yourself, but also for your mate, for your children, for your roommate, for other people that you love. You can make these petitions for others as well. And I think those of you who are married, that your husband would be so thankful, especially if he's a follower of Jesus, if he knew that he had a wife who was praying these things for him every day. He'd be really thankful if he has a wife who's growing in these things, praying them for yourself. And even if you're not married, these are things that we need to be asking God to make true in our lives continually. So number three, fill me with your spirit. Now, I think you know that the Holy Spirit, first of all, is not an it. He is a person. He's a third member of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is God. He's co-equal, co-eternal with God. He can be grieved. He can be offended. He can... Um, be believed in. He can fill us with his, himself. He fills us with God. It's the spirit of Christ filling us. And I don't think we stop and think often enough about how dependent we are as Christians on the Holy Spirit for every aspect of the Christian life. We are utterly dependent on him. And I think if we realized that, if we thought about it, we would pray more often, oh God, fill me with your spirit. Let me just make a list and don't try and write all these down because they'll be on the website, on the transcript. But I, I just some things that the Holy Spirit does, we could add many more to this list. But we know that the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Until you have that conviction, you're never gonna know your need for a savior. Until you're convicted that you deserve the wrath of God, you'll never come to Jesus for mercy. So who brings that conviction? The Holy Spirit, right? Who draws us to Christ? Who woos and wins our hearts to the love of God? It's the Holy Spirit. Do you know if it weren't for the Holy Spirit? I was saved at the age of four. You may have been four or 44, but um, you would never, I would never have turned to Christ in faith and repentance if the Holy Spirit had not wooed me to Christ, if he had not pursued my heart and drawn me to Christ and made Christ to be beautiful to me and lovely. Valerie, you were sitting in my house that day almost 20 years ago 
When the Lord opened your eyes, opened your heart to show you your need for a savior, that was the Holy Spirit who was working. I was teaching the class, but the Holy Spirit was drawing you to Christ. That's who draws all of us. The Holy Spirit quickens us to respond to Christ once we've seen that he is the Savior and that we need him. It's the Holy Spirit who regenerates us, who gives us the new birth, who converts us. It's the Holy Spirit who baptizes us into Christ. It's the Holy Spirit who seals us for the day of our final redemption, Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 4. It's the Holy Spirit who illuminates the scripture to our understanding. You find sometimes as you're reading God's word, you're meditating on it and something just jumps off the page at you. It quickens your spirit, quickens your heart. Who's doing that? It's the Holy Spirit who's making the word. He's illuminating it. This is not some ordinary book. This is a book that the Holy Spirit makes alive in us and to us and through us. It's the Holy Spirit who reveals and personalizes Christ to us, makes him lovely to us, makes him real to us. It's the Holy Spirit, according to 1 Peter 1, who motivates and enables us to obey God's word. I can read things in here, but I don't have the power to obey or the desire to obey unless the Holy Spirit puts that desire and that ability in me. It's the Holy Spirit who conforms us to the image of Christ, who sanctifies us, who leads us, who empowers us for witness, who assures us that we are children of God, who produces the fruit of Christ's likeness in us. It's the Holy Spirit who gives spiritual gifts for the building up of the body, who anoints us for ministry, who washes and renews us, Titus 3. It's the Holy Spirit who teaches us what and how to pray when we don't know what or how to pray. So you better be filled with the Holy Spirit if you want to be a praying woman. It's the Holy Spirit, according to Romans 8, who delivers us from the power of sin and from the law of sin and death. So many times we feel, I want to obey God, but I just can't. This world is pulling me down. Indwelling sin is pulling me down. Who sets us free from the law of sin and death? It's the Holy Spirit who does that in us. It's the Holy Spirit who gives us access to the Father, Ephesians 2. Romans 5, it's the Holy Spirit who pours God's love into our hearts. Acts 9, it's the Holy Spirit who comforts us. And and in Isaiah 44 and 32, it's the Holy Spirit who restores and renews and revives. He quickens, he brings life. The Holy Spirit in us is the source of fullness and of life. It's the Spirit of Christ. I love that passage in John chapter 7, beginning in verse 37. On the last day of the feast, that great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now we could do a whole series on those three verses. I won't. Let me just take a minute here. What did it mean for Jesus to be glorified? Well, he was glorified when he went to the cross. He was glorified when he rose from the dead. He was glorified when he ascended to the right hand of the Father. And when he did, the Holy Spirit was given by the Father to those who believe in Christ to live in us. Christ in us. That's the Holy Spirit. And as a result of Jesus sending his Holy Spirit to live in us, Jesus said, if you believe in me, you will be filled with that Holy Spirit. And as a result, rivers of living water will flow out from your heart, flow out of your innermost being. You want to be a fruitful woman? You want to be a woman who exhibits the fruit of the Spirit in your life? You want to be a woman who's a spring of life and joy to others? then you need to get filled with the Holy Spirit because that's where we receive fullness. Out of his innermost being, his heart will flow rivers of living water. I don't know about you, but that's the kind of Christian I want to be. That's the kind of woman I want to be. I want to be a life-giving woman, a woman who is overflowing with the love of Christ and the joy of Christ and the fruit of Christ, a woman who blesses those around me not just by what I do, but by them seeing the spirit of Christ flowing out of my life to touch their lives. And so in this passage, we see that it starts by being thirsty. 
We're always thirsty. And when we're thirsty, what does Jesus say to do? Come to me. Come to him. Continuously thirsty, continuously coming to Jesus, continuously drinking, continuously believing, continuously being filled and satisfied with his spirit, continuous inflow of the spirit into our lives makes what? Continuous outflow of that river of life. Continuous fruitfulness, the fruit of the Spirit, being a blessing to others. So we need constant inflow. Lord, fill me with your Spirit, which produces continuous outflow. Lord, flow through me to others around me. And that fruitfulness isn't just for women who have public ministries or Bible teachers or small group leaders. That's for you. He wants your life to be fruitful in your home, in your workplace, in your school, wherever God has put you. He wants those rivers of living water to flow out from you to those around you. And so in Ephesians 5, and in fact, I want to invite you to turn in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 5. We're told in verse 18, you familiar with this verse, be filled with the Spirit. This is how we know we're supposed to pray this. Lord, fill me with your Spirit because you've told me to be filled with the Spirit. And you know you've probably heard this taught on that this is not a suggestion. This is a command. Be filled with the Spirit. And it's not a one-time thing. It's an ongoing, continuous filling, a way of life. Be being filled with the Holy Spirit all the time. Keep being thirsty. Keep coming to Jesus. Keep drinking. Keep believing. Keep being filled with the Spirit. Continual intake, input, and continual outflow. So now the question is, how can we know if we're filled with the Holy Spirit? I'm glad you asked because this passage goes on to tell us. Ephesians 5, verse 18 through most of chapter 6. And I want to just walk quickly through touching on highlights of the rest of this chapter and the next to show you some characteristics and evidences to know if you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So if you're filled with the Spirit... You're not going to be controlled by any substance, which could include an activity, a relationship, anything that leads to excess, to dissipation, to wickedness. Instead, you're going to be controlled by Christ, by his spirit. And then verse 19, verses 19 and 20, talk about worship as an evidence, an expression of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the spirit, verse 19, addressing one another, this is our public worship, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. That's our private worship. Private worship, public worship. Verse 20, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So how do you know if you're filled with the Holy Spirit? One way to know is, are you a worshiper? Do you have a Godward focus? Do you have a thankful heart? Do you sing to the Lord? Do you worship him in your heart privately? Do you worship him publicly? Do you enter into the worship in your church services? You may not love the style of music. I've pretty much decided that there may not be a church where I'm going to love all the music until I get to heaven. And then somehow we're all going to love all of it. I don't know how that's going to happen. But I know this. When I go to church and I engage, I sing. I sing out, I participate, I worship the Lord. God does something in my heart. It's an expression of being filled with the Spirit. And then to be filled with the Spirit affects our relationships in multiple ways. First, our relationships in the body of Christ. Verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is all an expression and evidence of being filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. What does that mean? Well, I think it means that in our relationships, in the church, in the body, with one another, we're not going to be dominating, intimidating, resistant, contentious. Instead, we're going to honor one another. We're going to defer to one another. We're going to submit to one another out of reverence and respect and fear for Christ, who is the head of our body. And we are one with him. So if you are one with your head, then you're one with every other member of the body. So we're not going to have divisions and schisms and contention. And if we do, we're going to deal with them in repentance, right? There's some women here today from two different churches that have come together through a whole series of circumstances and have become one local body here. And it sounds like God is doing a sweet work because of those two churches 
both having needs, having come together. I don't know all the details on that, but I think there's probably some submitting to one another that has to go on for that to happen. Relationships not only in the body, but now here's where the rubber meets the road, in our families. And the relationships in our families, if we're filled with the Spirit, will be characterized by order, by sacrificial, purifying love and respect and honor. Listen to this in verse 22 of chapter 5. Wives, this is all an expression and outflow of being filled with the Spirit. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives. And it goes on and says that to love them is to nourish them, it's to cherish them. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Verse 33, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Listen, if you don't respect your husband, if you don't reverence him, if you don't submit to him out of fear for Christ, if your husband is not loving you in a sacrificial, selfless, serving way, then there's an absence of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. You know, our founder of our ministry, who's been with the Lord for many years now, he used to say, this is back in the 70s and 80s when people were writing a lot of new books on marriage and family, and there were conferences and seminars. And he said, you know what, if you want to have a good marriage and a good family, you can read all these books and go to all these conferences, a lot of good ones, or you can get filled with the Holy Spirit. And that doesn't mean the books aren't helpful and the conferences aren't helpful, but you can go to all the books and the conferences, and if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, you're not going to have things right in your home. It continues in chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. That doesn't have an age limit on it, by the way. Verse 4, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You see how family life is an expression of being filled with the Holy Spirit? Or not, right? So think about the climate, the atmosphere in your home in this season. And say, is there evidence that as the woman in my home, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit? Now, you may not be married, you may be single, you may have a roommate, so maybe your home is more your workplace environment. But just ask, where you spend a lot of your time, in the relationships that you're closest to, is there evidence that you are filled with the Holy Spirit? Now, that doesn't mean that everyone else in your home or your workplace or your world is going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. There may be cantankerous people, there may be ornery people, there may be people who are really difficult to live with, but if you're filled with the Spirit, there will be a fragrance of Christ there that will make a difference. It'll make a difference in you. It'll make a difference in those around you. Here's another evidence of how being filled with the Spirit affects relationships, and that's in the workplace. Continuing in Ephesians 6, verse 5. And I won't read all of this, but verses 5 through 9, it talks about servants and masters. It talks about treating each other with respect, about serving as if you were serving the Lord. If you're the one in charge, you're the boss. Don't threaten those who work for you because you've got a master in heaven that you work for. So again, if you're filled with the Spirit, then these work relationships are going to be right. Look at verses 10 through 18 in Ephesians 6. Not only in our relationships, and in our work, but in our warfare. And again, I won't read the whole passage, but this is an evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Finally, verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. We're, we live in a, on a battleground. This is not a playground. This is a battleground, the Christian life. And being in this world as servants of Christ puts us up against the forces of evil. You don't have the strength to deal with those. You don't have the smarts to deal with those. Uh, Barb is a counselor. She's talked about some of the uh, counsel that she gives. People are s- today are so confused. They're so disordered. They're so dysfunctional. They have so much baggage, so much hurt, so much pain. And you can't sit for one hour or two or six weeks or six months or whatever and meet people's needs when they have given their lives over to the deception of the enemy and to wrong ways of thinking, if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. But if you're filled with the Spirit, you will see God doing things in and through and around you that you just stand back and you say, I'm not smart enough to have done that. I'm not good enough. But God did it. God turned their heart. God changed their mind. God changed their thinking. God brought them to repentance. They're people you're burdened for. 
and you can see a battle going on in their lives. Maybe your children, maybe somebody in your family, maybe somebody in your workplace. Are you filled with the Spirit so that you can go into that battle and be helpful and be wise and be effective? And then verses 19 and 20 of Ephesians 6, our witness in the world is affected by our being filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Now that's not just for the Apostle Paul. We're all supposed to be declaring boldly as God wants us to speak in our world, our witness for Christ. How in the world can you do that if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit? We live in a world that is decidedly anti-Christ. And they're pushing Christians back into the corner, saying, you stay there, don't open your mouth, don't breathe, don't think, don't act, don't be a Christian. And so what do we do? We, so many of us just slink back into the corner and say, you know, get in our little holy huddle and hold, on, hold hands with you know, my fellow Christians until they hope for the rapture, right? <laughs> and God says, no, you're supposed to be the church out in the world. Go out there, love them, serve them, proclaim Christ, do it wisely, do it winsomely, do it in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Listen, when a small band of believers did that in the book of Acts, in this great pagan, wicked, evil Roman Empire, the whole Roman Empire was changed because the servants of Christ went out in the fullness of the Holy Spirit and proclaimed Christ with boldness and with love and with winsomeness and with fearlessness. They went out there and Jesus filled them with his spirit and amazing things happened. Why aren't amazing things happening today around so many of our churches and our lives? Could it be that we're not filled with the Holy Spirit? Say, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Well, if you want to know more about what it looks like to be filled with the Holy Spirit, look in Galatians chapter 5. That's where you see the fruit of the spirit. Walk by the spirit. You won't gratify the desires of the flesh. Listen, here's another evidence of being filled with the spirit, and that's that you'll have supernatural power. That's what we were just talking about. We cannot do what God has called us to do. We cannot be who God has called us to be in this world apart from being filled with his spirit. There's a quote by Corey Ten Boom that's written on a sign in the Corey Ten Boom Museum in Holland. It says, trying to do the Lord's work in your own strength is the most confusing, exhausting, and tedious of all work. But when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, then the ministry of Jesus just flows out of you. That's what we want. When Mary said to the angel, how can this be? You've chosen me for this task. She's a young teenage girl. She's never been intimate with a man, and and the angel says you're going to have a baby, and the baby's going to be the son of God. I mean, you talk about just blowing all your circuits. How can this be? It's impossible. It truly was impossible. Do you ever feel like what God has called you to do is truly impossible? It is. I feel that all the time in the work God's called me to. God's asking me to do some things in this season of my life, and I'm going, this is impossible. I can't do this. How can this be? I love the angel's answer in Luke 1.35. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Ask God to fill you with his spirit. The Holy Spirit, Jesus said, is a good gift. And if you are a child of God, then the Holy Spirit lives in you. You're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You don't need that to happen again but he wants to fill you, every part and parcel and particle of you, with himself, with his spirit, your words, your speech, your actions, your attitudes, your thoughts, your perspectives, your worldview, your day, your night, your everything. He wants to fill us. So as we're dependent upon the spirit, directed by the spirit, energized by the spirit, then the supernatural power of Christ will be manifested in and through our lives. So as you think about what God's called you to do in this season, are you depending on your own abilities, your own resources, your own natural abilities, or on the power of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, to live the Christian life and to serve him? Let's bow our hearts and pray. And each of these days, I'm praying a prayer and inviting you to make it your prayer as we lift these petitions up to the Lord. So thank you, Father, for sending your Holy Spirit 
to live in me and to comfort, lead, and purify me. Please empty me of myself. Fill me with your spirit and produce in me the likeness of your son, Jesus. I want to live in the realm of the supernatural, not depending on my natural strengths and abilities, but drawing upon the power of Christ. Anoint my life, my worship, my work, my relationships, my witness, my service for you with the supernatural power of your spirit flowing through me. Please, Lord, fill me with your spirit. And by faith, I believe that you have and that you will. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.